Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome. It's just it, 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 days like today where we, we were just commenting, where we can take a breath and slow down and celebrate our, our accomplishments is just such a wonderful day. So welcome to the Luan Aday Distinguished Lecture. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Teresa Mayer. I'm the new Executive Vice President for Research and Partnerships. And uh, this week uh, also represents the end of my third month on campus. And it's been an exciting three months um, getting to know or, or relearn about Purdue um, and having a chance to visit with um, so many of our excellent researchers and scholars across campus. So it's, it's really a pleasure to be here serving in this capacity. Um, it's also a privilege to be participating in this event, uh, again, taking the time to reflect on our tremendous accomplishments and listening and le uh, learning from uh, the accomplishments of our faculty who are being recognized uh, throughout the day and into the evening. We have a very nice dinner uh, planned for a much larger group to celebrate our accomplishments. Um, 2019 marks the third year for the Luann Aday Award. Um, this was established by an, a Purdue alumna, uh, Luann Aday. And importantly, this was to annually recognize a faculty member who has made a major contributions and impact on his or her field in the humanities and social sciences. And so again, we were just talking about the fact that we um, now have endowed uh, awards that span across the entire university. And so um, this is a very nice uh, uh, recognition by our alumni to endow these awards. Uh, the Luann Aday Award winners are nominated by their peers and approved um, by our office, as well as the president of the university. Um, at this time, I would like to acknowledge any past Luann Aday or any other of the Distinguished University awardees um, attending the lecture today. And so if you're here, would you please stand? We would like to recognize you. Thank you for your participation. It's also my pleasure to invite you to a reception immediately following the lecture. The reception is in the Stewart Center's Robert Ringel Gallery, just to a left and across the hall when exiting uh, Fowler Hall. Um, and now I would like to welcome to the stage Dorothy Teagarden. Department of Nutrition Science Professor and Director of the Women's Global Health Institute. Dr. Tiergarten is the nominator of this year's awardee and will introduce Dr. Shelley McDermott Wadsworth as this year's recipient of the Luann Aday Award. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's a little tricky up here. Good morning. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. I can't see you. Uh, Dr. Shelley McDermott Wadsworth, a professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies in the College of Health and Human Sciences. Her exceptional research in the field of work and family have earned her the designation of being in the top 10 in the world in her field. Her more recent focus on military families, however, has been particularly impactful, I think, not only through her own research, but also through her efforts to increase the quantity and quality of research in this field. Uh, to do this, she initiated a series of international symposium and subsequent uh, written volumes um, revolving around critical and understudied military family issues. She brought together researchers from many disciplines to develop uh, new and innovative evidence-based research in the field. <clears throat> Since the first symposium, the amount of research in this field has exploded and led to the development of interventions that are based on research that improve the lives of military and veteran families. I think it's particularly notable that she took this research to the next level to impact policy in very significant ways. For example, to redefine what, what a family means or what a family is in military programs. 
I think we're all looking forward to her presentation. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Shelley McDermott Wadsworth, the 2019 Leanna Day Award. It is a great honor for me to give this address today, and I really appreciate that you all have come. I hope to make it a good use of your time. In the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to address three questions. Why should we consider families in our work? What can we learn from studying military families that might help all families? And how can and should scientists have impact in times of war? Before I do that, I want to thank Dorothy Teagarden, who nominated me for this award, and Melissa Franks, who assisted her. I would not be on the stage without their effort. I'm also grateful to Luann Aday, who could not be here today, but sent me a lovely note. Although I am the named recipient of this award, the work that I'll talk about today is the result of work by many others. I want to give my thanks to the talented and dedicated staff of the Military Family Research Institute, some are sitting there, um, and the Center for Families who give their best effort every day. I want to give thanks to all the students who have taught me. I'm grateful for the opportunities provided me by leaders in the department, college, and university. My colleagues and collaborators in HDFS and elsewhere have been generous and supportive. The donors and advisory councils at MFRI and the Center for Families have been energetic and inspiring. Many funders have supported the work, but I must especially recognize Lily Endowment, who literally called me out of the blue one day more than a decade ago. The image you see here uh, is of Donna Lero and I, uh, Donna is an MS and PhD graduate of our department and a 2002 distinguished alum of our college. She was also my undergraduate mentor at the University of Guelph. All my life, women and men have invested in me when they didn't have to, and any accomplishments of which I have been a part belong to them, too. I also want to express my appreciation for everyone here who has served in or alongside a military member, in the military or alongside a military member. Let me now turn to the first question I want to address. Why should we consider families in our work? My answer is that they're fascinating and they're important. One reason that they're fascinating is that they really do not occur naturally. It turns out that it takes much more than making babies to make a family. While virtually all cultures around the globe and throughout history have traditions associated with kinship and reproduction, mothers giving birth to babies, human societies have constructed families through social rules about sexuality, relationship formation and dissolution, allocation of paid and unpaid work, property transfer, resource allocation, residence location, and sometimes even affection. There is a bewildering diversity of arrangements around the world and throughout history. Lines of descent may flow through mothers or fathers. Rules of marriage may specify one or multiple partners, such as polygamy practices in the Arab world. Some cultures do not insist that there are only two genders, such as the two-spirit tradition in Native American cultures. Some cultures treat men and women as almost interchangeable when dividing up responsibilities for caregiving and hunting. The kin terms we use in North America come from Eskimo culture, but other cultures have completely different nomenclature. There are huge variations regarding where family members live and with whom they have emotional bonds. We would be foolish to think that we know the best kind of family form. Strangely, Scientists discovered families only quite recently. Until more than 100 years ago, few distinctions were made between households and families. 
And there are many examples of scientists imposing their modern understanding of family life on the historical record. Later, careful documentation of household structures as well as kin ties revealed that historical change is far more complex than a simple shift from extended to nuclear families. The orgy of domesticity after World War II spawned not only 76 million babies, uh, but also a romance with the notion of a traditional nuclear family as a gold standard that continues to shape both science and policy in our culture. States use families as a mechanism for social control. They incent families to behave in certain ways and sanction deviation from acceptable practices. Think of all the LBGTQ husbands and wives who today are officially recognized as being part of families, but less than five years ago were no more than roommates. Families are not just passive recipients of outside forces, but exert considerable influence around the world. They are economically powerful. In the US, about one in five firms with employees is family owned. Around the world, the top 500 family-owned businesses generate annual revenues of $8.1 trillion and employ 28 million employees. Perhaps you are familiar with some of these firms. Families are politically powerful. Today, around the world, more than one in 10 countries are led by a royal family or some other hereditary line. A recent study in the journal Historical Social Research reports that one in 10 world leaders comes from households with political ties. And as you can see, the United States is no exception. Families are distinct from other social groups. It's difficult to think of a social group that any human participates in that lasts as long, involves such strong interdependence with others, controls the bearing and rearing of children, and is fun fundamentally multi-generational. Families do work that it would be difficult or impossible to produce or pay for through other means. The AARP report Valuing the Invaluable estimates that in 2013, family caregivers provided 37 billion hours of care, valued at more than $470 billion, a value almost equaling the sales revenue of Walmart that year, and exceeding by a considerable margin total Medicaid spending in that year. Families are the source of much that is good in our lives and much that is bad. As wonderful and important as the socialization, nurturance, love, and support we receive from our families, families also can be crucibles of conflict, dominance, unfairness, hostility, neglect, and violence. Families are politicized both from within and without. As long as we have studied families, we have struggled to deal with what they should be or what we want them to be and what they really are. Swirling within the political debates about family life is an amalgam of personal experience, religious conviction, and unconscious bias. Scientific evidence, too, is subject to blind spots and oversights. Sometimes our debates are more about the forms that families take than about how well they are carrying out their functions. Family life is always changing, and new problems and opportunities are always emerging. We have to keep challenging ourselves to maintain sharp focus on the data. Why should we all think about families in our work? Because it's hard to imagine a topic of study that is completely divorced from family life. Our development of language, literacy, and for David, numeracy. How we learn to get along with others what we eat and how and where we eat it, what er work ethic we learn, the occupations we choose, how we solve problems and cope, for, cope with stress, when and how we seek health care and how well we adhere to medical advice, the leisure activities we engage in, how we interact with devices and technology. There's virtually no aspect of human existence that is untouched by family life. I'm going to move on now to my second question. What can we learn from studying military families that might help all families? First, some background. Today, the US military comprises one, about 1.3 out of every 100 members of the US labor force. Since 1973, all members of the military have been volunteers, 
following over 100 years of off and on conscription. These service members are young. They are somewhat more likely to marry early relative to their peers in the general population. They're also more likely to have their children in their 20s as opposed to their teens or their 30s. About 17% are women. And the number of family members defined as spouses and children is larger than the number of service members. Military members are more likely than age comparable members of the general population to have completed a high school education, but less likely to have earned a college degree because most enlisted members join right out of high school. About two thirds of those who apply to join the military are accepted. The average length of service is about 6.7 years, and 80% of service members today have a family member who has served. Many military members consider military service to be the family business and possibly even a calling. Military members do not disproportionately come from poor families, but many do come from difficult family backgrounds that expose them to adverse childhood experiences. Military work is extreme work. This is a picture that I keep in my office. The little circle is a picture of the front of my filing cabinet where this photograph lives. I keep it there to remind me about what we ask these young men and women to do. I, when I first saw this, I thought they were dead. This is how they were sleeping. They give up significant personal freedoms and rights to privacy. They relocate about three times as often as civilians and experience large numbers of short and long separations regardless of whether there's a war on. The military also, though, provides substantial support for families, including subsidized accredited child care, home visiting programs for new parents, youth programs, support for families with children or adults who have special needs, and family support centers on every installation, in addition to health insurance and retirement benefits. More than two thirds of active duty military families live in civilian communities, however where they attend school, work, and receive medical care, even if provided through military insurance. Under normal circumstances, rates of illicit drug use, maltreatment of partners and children, and suicide are lower in the military than in the general population. But chronic challenges include high rates of heavy alcohol use among service members and, un and underemployment among spouses. Since the start of the current conflict, there have been increases in rates of child maltreatment and violence toward women. Just a few weeks after September 11th, 2001, the United States launched military operations in Afghanistan. This has now become the longest conflict in US history and has lasted the entire lifespan of most of the students who entered Purdue this semester. Every conflict is unique and this conflict is unique in its reliance on volunteers rather than draftees, a military roughly 30% smaller than 30 years ago, and the large role of the reserve component. Compared to earlier conflicts, post 9-11 deployments have been longer, likely to be repeated, and to have included exposure to combat. Thanks to medical and technological advances, Many service members have survived wounds, illnesses, and disabilities that might previously have proved fatal, though sometimes returning with life-altering consequences, casualties of a different kind, invisible wounds such as mental health challenges and cognitive disabilities have also become more prominent. 2.77 million service members have completed deployments totaling 3.1 million service years, person years, sorry, uh, since 9-11. Uh, Over 2 million children have been exposed to prolonged separations from their parents. Combat deployments are associated with psychological problems not just among service members, but also among spouses and children. Over 5,000 service members have been killed in hostile action. 50,000 have suffered serious physical wounds and over 500,000 traumatic brain injuries depression and or PTSD. Between 275,000 and a million family members, obviously not a very precise estimate, uh, are now providing or have provided significant care for wounded, ill, or injured service members. Suicide rates among veterans, though leveling off, are still more than 50% higher than rates among civilians, and rates among active duty service members reached unprecedented levels in 2018. 
I've just cribbed a little bit of text here from a policy brief written with Liz Coppola, Christine McCall, Keisha Bailey, and Brittany Mihalik Adkins. Thanks for the gift. Uh, why are deployments interesting from a scientific perspective? They're stressful and challenging for families, so of course we want to understand that better. But they're also similar to and different from other family stressors in interesting ways. Deployment involves separation from a parent, but unlike parental divorce or death, deployment is almost always temporary, even though it may be lengthy. Unlike parental incarceration, another temporary separation, deployment is usually treated with social approval. Like natural disasters and serious illnesses, deployment is significant and sometimes a traumatic family stressor. But unlike those stressors, deployment often happens to large groups of families all at once and with adva enough advance notice that there's at least the possibility for families to prepare and for scientists to conduct some assessments in advance. Deployment occurs within a culture where it is, at least to some extent, normal and where many supports are in place, including preparatory classes and other families who have had or are having similar experiences, giving scientists a good opportunity to assess whether that matters. I'm now going to go on and use our work to tell stories about three theoretical ideas that I think are really compelling and merit mo more attention. Uh, the first compelling construct is boundaries. This idea comes from family systems theory, as you probably know, and this perspective is by now essential for understanding families. Many assume its principles to simply to be true. Strangely, this perspective has not yet fully taken hold in the Department of Defense and the Department of Veterans Affairs. Family systems theory is a descendant of general systems theory, which radically transformed how we understand organizations. Prior to this time, principles from physics were used to argue that organizations with the right structure would function well. Austrian biologist Ludwig von Bertalanffy proposed the radical idea that biology, not physics, should be the basis for understanding systems. Therapist Gregory Bateson first applied this idea to families. Key principles of family systems theory are that families are dynamic, constantly adjusting to the environment. Each element in a family system is affected by every other element, and families contain subsystems that might be affected by other members of the family. There are boundaries around each subsystem as well as around the family as a whole. Here you see a relatively closed boundary. Here is a more permeable boundary. Because these boundaries can fluctuate in their permeability, we were very intrigued by the notion of how families manage their boundaries when one member is removed from the family by wartime deployment. Recent studies of boundary management focus mostly on maternal gatekeeping, that is behavior by mothers to shape fathers' relationships with their children, often following divorce. Deployment presents an interesting flip in these circumstances where there's every expectation that the service member will return unlike divorce, and considerable social pressure to maintain a strong relationship with him or her. How did we begin to study deployment and boundaries? In MFRI's first life long ago, we were the research house for the Office of Military Community and Family Policy in DOD. We itched to do a study of deployment, but they, strangely, had other ideas and kept us focused on other projects. Out of sheer desperation, we went a little bit rogue, and decided to conduct a study of a local unit, a Lafayette unit, that had been deployed uh, to, the OI to OIF uh, quite early in the conflict. As soon as they returned, we launched a qualitative longitudinal study and over the next year conducted interviews with service members and a loved one in person or by telephone on seven occasions. We asked them about the plans and strategies they used to keep the service member involved during the deployment. Authors on the paper reporting the results of this study include graduate students Christina Marini, Young and Kwan, and Colleen Pagnan. What did we learn? We learned that families worked hard to maintain relationships across this boundary and came up with many creative strategies. This was kind of the Olympics of gate opening strategies to facilitate and promote relationships with serv deployed service members and make the boundary more permeable especially for relationships with children. There was kind of a cottage industry uh, of ideas like this in the early years uh, of the war. 
We learned that these actions were not taken just by spouses, but also by extended family members. We learned that they were not aimed just at adults, um, but also at children. We learned that families relied on both synchronous communications, like telephone and video calls, and asynchronous communications, like letters, packages, and pre-recorded uh, audio and video materials, such as reading books on tape before they left. We also learned, however, that divorce dynamics still applied. The divorced families in this study did more gate blocking, like refusing to get children out of bed in the middle of the night when a service member seven time zones away in Iraq got his authorized 10 minutes for a call. We also learned that gate managing behaviors, in particular taking over service members' responsibilities during their absence and withholding information. Both service members and family members withheld information from one another, usually in well-intentioned attempts to protect one another from worrying or scary information, as you can see from the quotes on the slide here. Christina Marini, now a faculty member at Adelphi University, has completed a series of studies about the strategies that family members use to try to buffer or protect each other in this way. Ironically, it turns out that it doesn't really help. I have become convinced that one of the defining features of wartime deployments is the ambiguity and worry that surround them. Pauline Boss first called attention to the boundary ambiguity that occurs when someone is physically absent but psychologically present. And we observed it in this study as well. Ambiguity is difficult because actions take on heightened significance. It can seem to the separated family member that a signal is being sent about whether they will still be welcome in the family when they return. Everything is heightened in meaning, and it's easy to overreact to small things. Helping people to understand the symbolic importance of their actions around transitions and learning how to negotiate ways to make decisions together seems wise. Several subsequent studies have built on this early work. Melissa Franks and Steve Wilson had partners complete communication diaries during deployment to examine exactly how they maintain their relationships, not just in terms of how much and how long they communicate, but also by what means and what they communicate about. They learned that partners and service members communicated very frequently, multiple times a week, and used multiple means, including video, phone, Facebook, texting, and email. They even sent packages. Imagine that. They rarely disagreed. Partners felt more connected to their service members when they made decisions together and when they received more support from their service member. The richness of video communication brought some benefits but also some risks. All this work on boundaries can be useful because it shows how families behave when there is every reason and lots of support for maintaining relationships despite severe challenges. These findings encourage us to help families find ways to prevent ambiguity during times of transition from corroding their relationships. We can help them understand the symbolic importance of behaviors that raise and lower boundaries and how to work with other family members constructively on, so decisions don't have unintended consequences. The second theoretical idea that really inspires me is time and timing. Here I draw on the life course perspective, which offers many useful tools. It pays careful attention to time, of course, but not just the time that elapses during our own lifetimes, but also the time that elapses throughout history. Glenn Elder recognized this when he saw how the consequences of the Great Depression were so much worse for children who were young when it started, rather than adolescents. The life course perspective recognizes multiple rhythms of time. One of these is industrial time, or the rhythms induced by our interactions with the economy. Tamara Haraven invented this term when she documented the key roles that families played in recruiting training, and supervising workers during the Industrial Revolution. We were inspired to think about it in terms of deployment, the pre, during, and post periods, and how they relate to each other. The life course perspective recognizes that we don't travel through, journey, through time alone, but instead are linked to others in our family who travel with us. You see a multi-generational family depicted on this slide. The experiences of these linked lives are interconnected, but not necessarily the same. 
Finally, the life course perspective is thoughtful about transitions, recognizing that some transitions are normative and expected, while others are much less so, and that their consequences can be quite different. Transitions are rarely sharply defined events. They are much more likely to be long and complex sequences of interconnected change. Inspired by all these notions, we have studied different phases of the deployment cycle, looking to see how linked lives change over time. Once again, we began with description, looking at the data from our Lafayette couples as they went through reintegration. We asked both service members and partners how they thought their relationship had been affected and what they saw as the strengths and weaknesses in their relationship. We asked them how their roles and responsibilities had changed. We knew from military educational programs that families were told to expect a honeymoon period following the service member's return. This idea is featured in one of the most popular models of deployment adjustment called the emotional cycle of deployment. This is a universal model, and I was always taught to be suspicious of such things, so we paid very close attention to the data. What we found was that service members and their partners did go through periods where they had idealized positive views of their partner or their relationship, but this happened for both partners at the same time only about half the time. It was more common when service members returned home, first returned home, and gradually shifted to something that we called realistic closeness, but again, not always synchronized. Turned out the honeymoon was a solitary experience for many people. They also told us about how their thinking about each other was changing. Right after reunion, service members and their partners did not report each other as members of their social network. They had learned to look to others. Over time, this shifted, but with difficulty. Another transition was from independence to interdependence, which occurred during the first six weeks following return. For some couples, this was one of the most difficult aspects of reunion. Finally, we learned that some couples had to reorganize their family responsibilities, not just when service members left and when they returned, but multiple times following return. With regard to household tasks, men sometimes reported that roles had changed uh, more than women as you can see on the quotes on the slide. And this is not limited to military people. In the study of work and family, you find that men and women have different ideas about who's doing what with regard to housework. Later, we had the opportunity to conduct a large study of National Guard families over the course of a full cycle of deployment. The Family Journeys study followed members of 36 Indiana National Guard units from prior to departure to a year following return. Data were collected during six in-home interviews, two communication diaries during deployment, and three bursts of daily telephone calls during reintegration to assess negotiations about household responsibilities. In-home interviews included both qualitative and quantitative questions and a video recorded observation of a family interaction task. At-home spouses and partners and up to two children were interviewed at each occasion if willing Service members were interviewed when they were not deployed. All but 12 of the service members were male, and all of the couples were heterosexual. This was before the end of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, 370 families entered the study. Although all had been cleared for deployment and thought they were going, 119 had their deployment canceled and thus became a comparison group for the others. Our early data analysis efforts have begun to trace the pathways of change over the course of a deployment cycle. Graduate student Liz Coppola, who's here, and faculty member Sharon Christ, have been examining the course of depression symptoms in service members and their partners. Several important findings have emerged from this work so far. First, most service members and partners seem to be displaying resilience. If you look at the class one trajectories with the purple bars, um, purple labels, you can see they're low and relatively stable across the whole cycle. Second, couples who went through deployment the groups on the bottom, show three pathways, not just two. And third, not shown here, the depression trajectories of couples who experienced deployment were not linked to each other, but the trajectories of couples who never experienced deployment were. We're now trying to think about time in even more complex ways, still building on inspiration from the life course perspective. A recent paper depicts our thinking about how three key rhythms of time might relate to each other. First, the bottom rhythm of industrial time, or the rhythm of the deployment cycle. Then, above that, 
established properties of couples, the personality, if you will, of their relationship as they come into a stressful experience. And third, at the top, the daily flutter of conversations and communications as partners go about their business. Graduate student Christine McCall is now looking at interactions between these timescales, tracing effects from couples' patterns um, that are well established prior to reintegra reintegration through their later daily interactions to how couples are functioning a year after return. This work will help to address questions about what it really takes to dislodge established couple patterns. How robust are they? So our studies of linked lives are showing us examples not only of linking, but also unlinking. Interdependence between spouses evolves over time, growing and shrinking as they experience separation and other stressors. We suspect that some couples are going to prove more resistant than others to unlinking, but that story is still being written. The final theoretical idea that I'll focus on today is family resilience, the most compelling of the ideas I've shared and also the hardest to pin down. Resilience refers to positive adjustment despite adversity and was inspired by observations of adults who came out of concentration camps somehow untouched or even enriched and children who survived and even thrived in orphanages. Froma Walsh, a family therapist, has proposed a framework for resilience in families. As with family systems theory, a core principle is that family resilience is not simply the sum of the resilience of the individuals in the family. Family resilience is about shared characteristics and skills that will allow families to function well. For example, Every person in the family might be a good problem solver on their own, but if they are unable to work well with others to solve problems, that family is unlikely to be resilient. One of Walsh's three core principles is meaning. Our finding about boundaries are, are very consistent with this. Boundary management behaviors take on added significance, bigger meaning, under conditions of extreme ambiguity, and then have more serious consequences. A second of Walsh's core principles is effective communication. The research program Christina Marini is building directly addresses these principles. She's been studying psychological well-being before and after deployment and how it's related to the ways that couples communicate. She's used the family's journeys data to show that partners who have more severe symptoms of depression before deployment engage in more minimizing ways of communicating with their service member during deployment which in turn predicts more serious depression symptoms in service members following deployment. In this case, minimizing communication takes the form of dismissal, where a, a spouse would wave the service member's concerns aside or act unaware of them. Avoiding minimizing communication is a teachable skill. A third of Walsh's principles is family organization. Families in which the members are not in their rightful places, such as when children are in charge of the parents, tend not to function well. Once again, we have qualitative data that speak to this issue, specifically with regard to the behavior of fathers as they came and went from their families for each successive deployment. We learned that some fathers essentially acted as visitors, tending to leave most child-rearing responsibilities to their wives on favoring child-led activities such as play while home. These fathers could not fully resolve their image of what it meant to be a father, which meant being there, and having to be away so much. These are the fathers on the left of the screen. In contrast, fathers we called instrumental fathers rejected the idea that their lack of time with their children meant they could not be active parents. And there's growing evidence that fathers' roles in families matter a great deal. And so when these military fathers decide to become visitor fathers, it may have downstream consequences for their children. We got a small hint of this in a paper led by Herman Posada using data we collected in partnership with Sesame Workshop. Mothers of young children in military families reported that their children had more secure attachment behavior when fathers were more fully participating parents. And this finding applied even when mothers' own parenting behavior and depression were taken into account. One of the most challenging things about resilience is that it seems to be able to be achieved in different ways by different families. We know there are many ingredients to resilience, but we don't know which ones are interchangeable 
or whether there are key subsets. Statistical tests don't always help us because they're very driven by consistent patterns. Hunting for diversity can take special effort, particularly when we don't have thousands of families to study. So here's what we're doing now to study the multiple pathways to good outcomes. We've taken the answers that moms, dads, and kids have given to questions answered, asked one year after return about how they're doing, what's going well and what's going badly, and why they think that is. We, meaning Christine McCall, Liz Copeland, and Keisha Bailey and I, are coding all of these answers as reflecting positive or negative aspects of the family in five domains, physical and psychological health, employment, the couple relationship, or parenting. I owe Christine McCall nine cases tonight. Uh, once we have finished the coding, and only then, we're going to use service members and partners' quantitative assessments of their overall family functioning to assign families to groups where both partners say their family is functioning very well or very poorly, and groups where only one partner says so. In this context, good and bad means being in the top or the bottom 15% of the couples in the sample. So these are the folks who are doing particularly well or poorly. We're not going to peek at what group they're in until after the coding is done. And then we're going to look to see if we can see any systematic differences between the groups. What are all the ways that family can end up in that high, high group? We're hoping this will give us some clues about ways that we can go on to statistically document the multiple pathways to good outcomes. So what have we learned so far about my three compelling constructs regarding boundaries, we have learned that families work really hard during separation to be supportive and helpful, sometimes to a fault. This is done with the best of intentions, but can have problematic consequences. The high symbolic importance of boundary management during times of ambiguity means that couples may benefit from learning ways to negotiate those times together. Regarding linked lives through time, we have learned that spouses may uncouple at different points in the deployment cycle, and that it can take considerable time and effort to reestablish their interdependence. Regarding resilience, we have learned that military dads may struggle to maintain their proper role with their children. And there are useful skills that families can learn that may help them avoid communicating in unfortunate ways, even when they are struggling with depression. Going forward, we're going to continue analyzing family journeys data, but our next large study is already in the works. We're going to be looking at the long-term impact of deployments on families with children who are now adolescents, but who were separated prior to age five from their military parent due to wartime deployment. Military youth around the world have given us advice about the methods for this study, and uh, they have decided that it should be named Operation Me, or Operation Military Experience. Uh, this is a picture of John Rudicelli, a military kid, who drew the winning logo for our study in our design competition. My final question today is how, can, how scientists can and should have impact in times of war. This requires me to talk about engagement. As a land-grant institution, Purdue's mission included service from inception. More than a decade, more, sorry, more than a century later, Boyer introduced the term, the notion of scho the scholarship of engagement saying, the scholarship of engagement means connecting the rich resources of the university to our most pressing social, civic, and ethical problems, to our children, to our schools, to our teachers, and to our cities. The scholarship of engagement also means creating a special climate in which the academic and civic cultures communicate more continuously and creatively with each other, helping to enlarge what anthropologist Clifford Geertz describes as the universe of human discourse and enriching the quality of life for all of us. This idea is not without controversy, and war sharpens the dilemma. Some scholars argue that universities should stay at arm's length from anything that touches political processes. Many scholars want nothing to do with war. On the other hand, thousands of service members had been sent into harm's way, and families all over the country have experienced distress. MFRI had been created to support military families, and so that is what we've continued to do. We've had some influence. There are several examples of legislation and policy that have been influenced by MFRI, including expansions of the Family and Medical Leave Act to cover deployment-related absences from work for spouses of service members, and expansions of the definition of family used in some DOD programs. Our largest program, Star Behavioral Health Providers, has 
strengthen behavioral health care for military and veteran families. It's been introduced in nine states, and the National Guard Bureau tells us it is their goal to take it to more than 20 states by the end of next year. That's news from last week, Kathy and my staff. Um, we've helped to promote research about military and veteran families. The nomination for the award, as Dorothy told you, was based on a series of international research symposia and these edited volumes that accompanied them. The most recent book, shown at the bottom right, was a battle plan for supporting families during wartime. An Indiana legislator ordered a copy of this book for every member of the House Armed Services Committee and their staff. And I'm told on good, uh, uh, good authority by a member of the MFR Advisory Council that he saw it in the Pentagon Library. It's really tricky, though, to get the narrative right. In a recent article, Scott Parrott documented media portrayals of service members and veterans finding heroes, victims, and charity cases in well-meaning efforts to convince policymakers to allocate resources to address issues, there is the risk of overemphasizing vulnerability and damage and brokenness. I worry that I've done this sometimes. Is it possible that we could have convinced strong, resilient people they're broken when they're not? Nonetheless, I've tried to distill some key elements that define my approach to engagement. It's important to point out that there are many ways to engage with the larger society. We don't all have to be interventionists or policy experts. Number one, honor the audience. Whomever it is that you're trying to influence, learn to understand their world and understand them as a respected expert. Only then can you know enough to come up with strategies that will be feasible. As we are preparing to launch Star Behavioral Health um, in nine states this year, we're beginning with a lengthy telephone call with each state to learn about how they currently handle referrals for care and about their worries and limitations. Not one state has called the National Guard Bureau to complain that we're coming in from the outside and telling them what to do, even though we are. Relationships take a long time to nurture and grow. My general expectation is that I will have worked to nurture a relationship for two or more years before anything can come of it. Even once we decide to work together, I have found it a good practice to have extensive what-if conversations to imagine things that might go wrong and how to deal with them. These dilemmas are much easier to address when no dispute is on the table yet. Number three, frame your questions and measures to address not only scientific problems, but also practical or policy problems. The two are not mutually exclusive, but sometimes there are ways to include items that are more useful. For example, measuring communication in ways that point to specific skills that could be taught can produce actionable information. We've been fortunate with the Family Journey Study to have a relationship with Project Focus, one of the largest family resilience programs instituted with military families over the course of the current conflict. Project Focus staff take our findings and use them to fine tune their program. So far, they've built materials related to couple communication and sibling relationships based on our results, allowing our findings to have immediate on-the-ground impact. Number three, anchor your engagement efforts. Simply writing something and throwing it out into the ether is unlikely to generate the impact you want. We try to figure out other ways to anchor our work, such as to professional associations or other partners. Leverage, leverage, leverage. For a research award we created, we select the best research article published in a year, and we do a press release about it. But that's just the beginning. Then we write letters to the deans and department heads of the nominated researchers to tell them about the wonderful work of their faculty and our wonderful award. We ask the journals where the leading articles were published to make them available for free for a few months. Let them brag. We hold an award ceremony sponsored by an organization of practitioners who then spread the word through their community. We created a lecture on this campus that is built into the colloquium series in several departments and bring nominated researchers to speak. We partner with educational committees that do webinar series so we can produce a session for them. And we do academic presentations and publications, all from one little award. Sometimes it's more important to focus on science other than your own. Helping engagement partners to gain access to, understand, and use scientific evidence is true engagement. Most of the engagement work in the Center for Families, or MFRI, is not about our own work. As you see, the books and symposia that are the basis of the nomination for the day all feature the work of other scholars. Serving as a convener of our scientific peers can be very worthwhile. Gratitude shared is gratitude multiplied. We work in a business where we must make our individual contributions clear. 
but there are ways to be seen as a leader without always being out in front. When star behavioral health has been implemented in states in the past, the in-state partner was always the, the visible lead, not us. MFRI maintains some consistent elements so that families can see the continuity, but otherwise we concentrate on helping our partner be successful. In the end, we all win. In closing, I came to Purdue and married my partner in the same semester 30 years ago. I'm aware that academic institutions were not designed with women in mind. Like Alice, the door has been too small for many women to succeed in higher ed and have families too. The first woman earned a PhD in the United States in 1877, almost 250 years after the first American university was founded. Women in positions of leadership in educational institutions and corporations have historically been disproportionately unlikely to sustain intimate relationships or have children. Generations of male academics, in contrast, have benefited from their wives' work as mothers and homemakers, sometimes in addition to working at their own paid jobs. Herbert Brown, Purdue's first Nobel Prize winner, thanked his wife Sarah for allowing him to focus on his creative efforts by handling the finances and maintaining the house and the yard. According to Brown, after receiving the Nobel Prize in Stockholm, he carried the medal and she carried the check. Women academics, of course, have always been more likely to have employed partners, but now men too have employed partners and are expressing greater desire to actively participate in family life and feeling the same work-family squeeze as women. While higher education has work yet to do, I'm grateful to leaders at Purdue for everything that they have done over the past 30 years to address these issues. But it takes partners too. Although words could never be enough, I want to publicly thank my partner, Michael, for his support for my work, and me as a person. He has accommodated all the evenings and weekends that I wanted or needed to work and all the unanticipated deadlines that seem to confound our best laid plans. He has collaborated with me to construct mutually satisfying domestic arrangements despite my pretty much complete lack of interest in housework. <laughs> he has thoughtfully joined me in reflecting about gender inequity at home and in the public realm, becoming not only an ally but an advocate. He has embraced with good humor my venting and insecurities and frustration and bossiness. His tolerance, support, cheerleading, advocacy, sympathy, collegiality, respect, patience, unconditional pride in my accomplishments, and of course his love, have meant that I have always been able to choose family and work. And for that, I am profoundly grateful. I hope that some of the ideas I've shared with you today will be useful to you in your work. I'm happy to be helpful to you however I can. And now I would be happy to answer any questions you might have in the remaining time. Thank you for your kind attention. Would anyone like to uh, ask a question? I will be happy to. Uh, Thank you for a great talk. Can you talk a little bit about what you know about how the family dynamics change when the partner is the deployed person is a woman and how that changes? You know, it's a really great question, and we don't know nearly as much as we should. It's really, really hard to get enough women in a sample to be able um, to study them. In the new study, we're stratifying by gender so that it'll be half men and half women, which makes Dave Top and I very nervous to recruit to fill that sample. Um, but our goal is to actually try to have enough women that we can really look at, at women's experiences. Women also um, are more likely to leave the military a little earlier when they want to have children. And the military is not a great place for women's marriages. Women's marriages in the military seem to be much more fragile than those of men. They're about six times more likely than men to be married to another service member. Uh, and, uh, and because they experience divorce at higher rates, they're also much more likely to be parenting stepchildren and have kind of complex family structures. But we don't know a lot about the internal dynamics in homes. In, interestingly, their husbands sometimes don't get treated very well by other wives. 
Um, Canona Southwell, one of my students, did a qualitative study of husbands of female service members. And he said, when he went to the family readiness group, um, they were always doing all these women things, like you know, Mary Kay parties and things, and he didn't want to do that. That I expected. What I didn't expect was that um, a husband met up with this guy and warned him away because he didn't want him hitting on this guy's wife at the family readiness group meetings. That I did not expect. Anyone else? Thank you uh, for a wonderful talk. I actually think I'd like to hear a second one on good partners and bad partners for oh. your kind of engagement work. And I wonder if you'd just say a little about that for people who uh, have not been involved in the extensive engagement that you have. Oh, that's a really great question. Um, uh, some of it was me. I've had to learn when people say, well, I really don't have time, or it's really not my interest, I should take them seriously and not think I can talk them out of it. It's sort of like deciding you can change your husband, right? You marry carefully. Um, but uh, the Star Behavioral Health Partnership has been really robust. It's a three-way partnership between um, the Center for Deployment Psychology at the Uniformed Services University, um, the National Guard, and us. And we've been at it for quite a few years. I think um, things that we've learned is um, we're absolutely rigorous about um, transparency and trust. Um, nobody ever has a meeting with, with, that the other person wasn't at without explaining what happened in that meeting. Um, and we try to uh, role play or, or problem solve everything that might come up in advance. And so when we go in, we kind of have our story straight. Uh, and, and this absolutely rigorous commitment to trust and transparency, I think, is, is great. I think the other thing that really makes it work is that each of us, through this initiative, can energetically pursue our own goal. Nobody had to veer off course. We found, truly, a win, win, win. And that makes it so easy uh, to hold together. It's really quite wonderful. We've been very, I had no idea how smart I was to choose a partner at the Uniformed Services University. It was this, one of the smartest things I ever did, and I had no idea how big it would be. Anyone else? Thank We're you. at the end of our time. Uh, I'm going to go to the reception. If anyone has a question, you can ask it uh, of me over sugar. Hopefully, hopefully there's sugar. Thank you all very much.